And I want to read tonight in Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through 7. Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through 7. Again, if it's your first, second time here, you're our guest. Welcome to the International Church of Las Vegas. I'm Andrew Mason, the lead pastor here at ICLV. And we're so honored to have you here with us. And we've been praying for this night to be a special night for all in attendance, including you. And we're so happy that you're here. Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through 7 says this, at that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first taken, the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea. Someone say Bethlehem. <laughs> you may not know this, but I actually was born in Bethlehem. Yeah. You have the honor of hearing a sermon on Christmas Eve from a preacher born in Bethlehem. Now, technically, it was Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, but it was Bethlehem, okay? It was Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. It's on my birth certificate for any birthers out there. I want to double-check this. But, hey, for people that weren't here, you can go tonight to your gathering and go, we heard a preacher from Bethlehem tonight at our church. That's all you got to say. It's totally true. had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. From this famous story, we now have this wonderful tradition of Christmas that we celebrate every year. When I thought about this, I asked myself the question, hey, what makes for a great Christmas here in, you know, 2022 in our modern era? What is it for people that makes for a great Christmas gathering? Is it, is it family? For some people, it's family. For other people, that's not on the list, but that's a, it's a mixed bag right there, right? But for a lot of people, it's family friends, people we love. It could be music. How many love Christmas music this time of year, right? Yeah. Maybe it's the decorations. How many love the Christmas decorations, right? For some, it might be the food. Come on, let's, let's divide the crowd up here this evening. Let's see. How many are Christmas turkey people? Lift a hand. Christmas turkey. All right. How many are Christmas ham people? Christmas ham. Oh, wow. Look at that. Christmas tamales. How many have some? Yeah. Anybody have beans and rice with their Christmas dinner? Anybody have that, beans and rice? Yeah, I thought so. One year in my family, we had duck. We had duck for Christmas. It took forever to cook. I think we ate around 9 o'clock at night, but it was like one of the best Christmas meals ever once it was ready. Oh, there's family, friends, music, decorations, food. Kids, is any, are there any kids here who like presents at Christmas time? How many, any kids excited for presents? Yeah. <laughs> but you know, as, we th as I thought about this, I thought, you know, there actually, there's an undercover hero of Christmas every year. That I, I promise you, if I surveyed all of you, 100% of you would not say what I'm about to say when you go, hey, what makes for a great Christmas? But I'm going to just throw this out there. I believe this is a key quality in a great Christmas, and it's this, the post-Christmas garbage pickup in your neighborhood. <laughs> that the undercover hero of Christmas is the garbage man. Because without that post-Christmas garbage pickup, it would be a mess. Yeah, sure, Christmas would be great, but it would all be a mess. We wouldn't be looking forward to next year. And so we just take it for granted, but it really is, I'm really thankful for the post-Christmas garbage pickup because they have a little grace and mercy with you. They give you a little flex. You guys ever notice that? You can put a little extra stuff out there, and they won't leave it there. They'll pick it up, right? So people have their bins out there, and then they have their extra boxes. People have their trees out there. How many thankful they take the trees, right? And then you always have that one neighbor, they're trying to game the system, right? They know it's a flex week, and so they try to stretch the rules. You're like, dude, just because it's the post-Christmas garbage pickup, you can't put your fridge out there in the sidewalk, dude, all right? 
Who's got that one neighbor, right, that's always pushing, always stretching it, seeing what they can get out of it? Don't be that person, okay? But no, it's, it's amazing to think of the best that there would be if we didn't have this little mechanism of the post-Christmas garbage pickup. It's really an undercover miracle every year that all this stuff gets taken away. And I thought about the first time John the Baptist recognized Jesus in Scripture. That was the first time we see Jesus in the flesh that we just read. But the first time John the Baptist saw Jesus in Scripture, he said, they said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Someone say, take away. He takes away the sin of the world. And what does the garbage man do? He, he takes away the tree and packaging of the world, right, after Christmas. And so, yeah, the, the, gar the post-Christmas garbage pickup is, is, is an undercover hero. And in the same way, Jesus was an undercover king. He came under the radar. He was the king of the Jews. He was the savior of the world. He was the Messiah. But he didn't come with all those things from an earthly perspective. How did he come as an undercover king? Well, the Jewish people, they wanted a Messiah who would solve all of their problems. Because they were under Roman oppression. They wanted a, a king like Solomon who would come in all of his riches and glory, who would overshadow the culture and civilization of Rome in that time. Or they wanted a warrior like King David who took out Goliath. They wanted a mighty warrior who could overwhelm the mighty uh, Roman military and, and kick them out of their Roman occupation in the promised land. That's the type of king they were looking for. Because if we, could, if we could just get someone to come in here and fix this messed up world, it's someone else's fault. It's all Rome's fault. It's all the government's fault. That's how they thought back then. You know, that's how people back then thought. If they could just get God to fix everybody else, send us a Messiah to fix, up, fix all these problems around us. See, Jesus was born as an undercover king because Jesus was sent to solve an undercover problem. It was a problem that people weren't looking at. People weren't asking God to address. Jesus can still do miracles today when we allow him to deal with the undercover problem. This is why so many people back then missed recognizing Jesus as the Messiah because when he was born... He didn't fit the profile of a powerful earthly king. Part of this was rooted in the Old Testament prophecy that Jesus actually fulfilled, but he fulfilled it in a way that they didn't expect. Micah 5.2, hundreds of years before Jesus was born, this prophet Micah prophesied, but you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, are only a small village among all the people of Judah, yet a ruler of Israel whose origins are in the distant past will come from you on my behalf. That they, there was a prophecy that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. In fact, when the Magi, when the wise men came to Jerusalem, the religious experts actually told them, you're going to find him in Bethlehem. So surely the Messiah would be born there because that's where the royal lineage of David hailed from. That's why Joseph had to go back there. And so, and so surely he would be born in Bethlehem. But here's the, here's the reality. Nobody cared about Jesus being born because there was no room for him in the inn. If they thought he was this mighty king, they surely would have had a spot for him to stay with his family. And yet Jesus still fulfilled this Old Testament prophecy miraculously undercover, under the radar, as an undercover king. They didn't have room for Jesus, but you know what's interesting enough? They did have space for sheep. They had space for a lot of sheep. You know why? Because Bethlehem was just six miles south of Jerusalem, and it was the origin for the majority of the sheep that were sacrificed in the temple. Bethlehem is where they would breed the sheep and they would look 
for the lambs without spot or blemish. And then they would get taken to the temple where long-distant travelers who came to worship at the temple, they could purchase a lamb without spot or blemish to offer in the temple. That's what Bethlehem had space for. No room for King Jesus, but plenty of space for sheep. Interesting. One would expect a mighty king to be born in a palace amidst luxury and expensive surroundings so that, you know, sophisticated dignitaries could come and welcome this newborn king to the earth. But we know that's not what happened. Luke 2, 7, it says he was born in a manger. A manger was nothing more than a barn, than a feeding trough for animals. Why would a divine king be born in such harsh and crude conditions and surroundings. It's interesting. And then another thing happened. Typically, the first to hear of a future king's birth were royalty and dignitaries, as, as we talked about. But this undercover king, he was a little different. <laughs> he was a little different. Look what it says in Luke. Luke chapter 2. And I'm going to read verses 8 through 18. Should be up there on the screen. And this is what it says in the New Living Translation. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. And suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem. Bethlehem, uh, Israel, back then, yeah. Bethlehem, Israel. The city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. And when the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Someone say, Let's go. Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And they hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in the manger. And after seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened. What the angel had said to them about this child, and all who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. And so the first to hear, the first to be invited guest to see the baby, right? How many of that's a big deal, right? Everybody, when there's a baby born, everybody wants to see the baby. And the first one to see this royal baby, it wasn't the rich and influential of the day was shepherds out in a field. Do you know that shepherds were looked upon as some of the lowliest status of society? Do you know that in the court of law, in the court of law, shepherds were not considered credible witnesses? And yet in heaven's eyes, these are the witnesses that God wanted to have for the birth of his son. Shepherds in a field. So all this begs the question, who is born in a manger, which shepherds know of first, located in the breeding grounds of temple sacrifices? The answer is so simple, a child could understand it. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's what Christmas was about. It was about the Lamb of God coming into the earth. The Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. Christmas isn't about a powerful earthly king who fixes all the problems around you. Christmas is about the undercover king, the Lamb of God, who comes to solve the undercover problem. That's what Christmas is about. Was it a miracle the Son of God came to the earth and was born? Yeah. Yeah. But the biggest miracle, though, is that God provided a lamb, a lamb in the breeding grounds of temporal sacrifices, born in a manger, witnessed by shepherds. God provided a sacrificial lamb without spot or blemish to take away your pain and to take away your sin. 
That was a bigger miracle. He was born to live a sinless life, die on the cross, and if you place your faith in him, if you confess him as Lord of your life, unequivocally, he will take away your sins, he will heal your pain, and he will do miracles in your life today. That is the hope of Christmas, church. Look at 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. What makes a great Christmas? What makes a great Christmas is receiving the Lamb of God into your life and allowing His sacrifice to cleanse you of your sin so that you can be saved and so that you can live out the plan and the purpose you were always designed for before the foundations of the earth. The Bible says he had your days written in his book. And tonight we want to give you a chance to receive the true miracle of Christmas and we believe it will change your life. That's why we're gathered here tonight. Praise God for the festivities. Praise God for everything that's gonna happen after this service. But God wants to do a miracle in your life through the story of Christmas. Worship with us.
everybody. My name is David, and this is my miracle. Like around three months ago, I started having a lot of pain in my back right here. And I'm like, oh man, what's that pain that I couldn't even sleep at night? Really, really bad. So I told my wife like, hey, this is not right. This pain, it's bothering me. I cannot sleep at night. So I went to get a CAT scan done, just to a peace of mind. And they called me the next day right away. And they say, hey, you know what? You have a mass there. We found a five millimeter mass um, with calcification, like a tumor. And I'm like, oh my God. And it's pushing in the main artery of the brain. So I'm like, right away, the next day, I call everybody at the church, like, hey, this is happening. So everybody start praying for me. And then uh, uh, they just say, take care of it. So I call and got an, uh, to schedule an MRI. And it was taking forever. Like every week, they change it. And by that time, everybody's praying for me. And like a couple weeks ago, they asked me, like, hey, David, how you feeling? Everybody's praying for you. I'm like, you know what? Actually, the pain is not there anymore it's weird but I'm still gonna do the MRI so last week I went and do my MRI finally and on Friday my wife called like to get the results and then she calls me and um, she's like hey babe guess what I'm like what God's still in the working miracles I'm like really what we won the lottery or what she's like no better than that you're healed I'm like what it's not there it's disappeared I'm like, oh my God, praise the Lord. So that's my Christmas miracle. Hello, my name is Tracy. And I want to give God all the glory for this incredible testimony. But I want to thank ICLB and I want to thank all the pastors and all the women that have supported me. Many, uh, many Sundays I've spent up here just in tears and crying. been a strain with my relationship with my son because of addiction, but God has been restoring that one day at a time. And so not only is he coming for Christmas tomorrow, so I'm, I'm going to pick him up at 12 o'clock at the airport for Christmas tomorrow, but God just, God is so good. The plane ticket was like seven or 800 bucks, and I was like, I don't know how I'm going to afford that. And God got that ticket for me for $337. So I'm grateful. Thank you all for your love and support. And uh, I'm just grateful. Glory to God. Hi, I'm Genesis. My, my miracle is all about how God saved me from fear. I was so bound by fear. I was worshiping it every single day. And I mean, I let it like guide my entire life. And it wasn't until I bought a Bible and I was actually practicing the Bible where I realized I didn't have to live like that. I didn't have to be so bound really by Satan. I learned how to cast it out. And I just love the freedom that God has given me. And I would have never been able to live a free life if I never bought a Bible. And I'm, God gives us so much authority too. You don't have to live in your anxiety. Anxiety is not who you are, it's Satan. He wants you to think that that's a part of you. It's not, you don't have to live like that. You can be set free just like me. I don't experience anxiety. The first time I shared my testimony, I said I would never share it again because I was so fearful. This is my second time sharing my testimony because I am so set free from the love of Christ. So yeah, that's my miracle, Jesus. <laughs> my work, my son's school, 
his soccer team and from the bus to the bottom. So six years later, for this Thanksgiving, we fed 135 homeless. Hello everyone, my name is Hia. Um, my soccer team, my brother, his friends and I gave out over 100 Christmas gifts this season. And I know God is using our family to be a miracle for those in need. Hello, uh, my name is Jason McLaughlin. Um, my miracle started in uh, 2015. Um, i trying to make this quick. Uh, 2013, I was in a really bad accident. Um, shattered my shoulder, my scapula. And uh, doctors told me that I wouldn't be able to use my shoulder or my arm anymore, um, more than this. And um, on top of that, not being able to work for two, for two years. So uh, I was a faith. We, we decided, me and my family decided to, you know, continue to tithe. And um, uh, had a had a, another surgery in 2014, I want to say. And um, we was about to have another one, went in to the doctor. Um, and they're they're going to do another one to basically break my shoulder again to 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 see if I can you know um, lift it higher. Um, but again, continue to tithe and not knowing where money's going to come from. And um, and you know, but my miracle is today. Now I'm after tithing and 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 being healed from from all of that. Um, now I I get to hold the camera in front of thousands and thousands of people, you know, up like this, and I have full motion. So that's, that's my miracle. Hi, my name's Carissa. Um, my miracle is actually we, me and my whole family got diagnosed with COVID um, about two weeks ago, and uh, I was at home with four children, six and under, uh, by myself, and my husband had just <laughs> miraculously went out of town on business, so he was able to quarantine um, by himself in a hotel room. I don't know how he got through it, but praise God he did, um, and I was at home with uh, four kids, and I have prayed for friends for a very long time, and I would come and go and people would come and go out of my life and um, when I tell you that my friends from ICLV showed out for me all the moms came um, to the point where I didn't even want to accept anything else they were dry cleaning my laundry there's a shortage in Tylenol that they were out searching for over three and a half hours they were sending target deliveries to my door it was just in abundance and abundance and abundance that I was just blessed and able to um, get through it and having the moms pray for me it was just it was a blessing so thank you my name's Jamie and I was in a really terrible rollover car accident my convertible flipped three and a half times um, and I was the flight for life flew me to the hospital with 13 fractured and broken bones I should have died that day but God had another plan so I'm here today because God still does miracles of the Lamb of God. 
He doesn't want to be an undercover king in your life. He wants to be the king. And the first miracle he wants to do is to give you the gift of the Lamb of God, his son, Jesus Christ, born on the first Christmas, sacrificed on a cross for your sin, and alive from the grave in power and victory. So that's the question I have for you tonight. Have you received the gift of Christmas? Have you received Jesus as the Lamb of God? Have you had your sins? Have you had your pain washed in the blood of the Lamb? We want to pray with you tonight. We want to lead you in a prayer. We've had 54 people in the month of December come down to this altar and say, I want Jesus as the Lamb of God to wash away my sins and forgive me. This month we've seen that happen. I'm gonna count to three and if you, if you need this tonight, if this message is for you, we're not into empty religion or dead tradition. We're into God transforming lives. So with every Christian praying, you're here and you need the Lamb of God to wash away your sins tonight on this Christmas Eve 2022. Not a better night to do it. I'm gonna count to three. When I get three, just lift your hand. Come on with every Christian praying. Let me hear you praying, Christians. One, you need to get right with God. Two, you need Jesus to wash away your sins this evening. Three, lift up a hand tonight. Yes, yes, there's hands all over the floor here, hands in the stadium scene. Keep that up, keep that up. Come on, keep praying, Christians, come on. I see hands all over the place. Come on, you need Jesus. You need to surrender to him tonight. You gotta come back to him tonight. Lift up a hand to him right now. You're not alone. You're not the only one. This message is for you tonight. Respond to him right now. Hallelujah. There's hands going up. Come on, I know we got kids here, we got plans, we're gonna do this real quick. Before I dismiss you, before you leave, we wanna pray with you. Altar team, if you could begin to come down this altar, if you raise your hand, just begin to make your way out of your seat and find one of our leaders here at the altar as we begin to worship before we dismiss. Hallelujah, hallelujah, church. Can we give a hand for those coming forward to receive Christ tonight? I can't, oh, even, I can't even count Come on them all. down. I promise you're not alone. I can't even, I can't even count them all. I can't even, oh, I can't even count them all. I can't even, I can't even The Lord is crowning you with his love right now. He's washing you in his love right now. He's filling you with his spirit. Someone online, you're with us online. You're giving your heart to Jesus right now. The Holy Spirit is there bringing healing and transformation. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. How many appreciate the testimonies that we heard tonight? Can we give all the people who testified tonight a big hand? That was awesome. That was awesome. Hey, we're going to be up here. If you need prayer for anything, 
for physical healing, for freedom from addiction, for, for if, you're, if you're feeling bound in discouragement and depression, we'll be up here to pray before you leave tonight. We have a service tomorrow at 10 a.m., a one-hour Christmas service tomorrow. I'll be preaching at too as well. But we love you. We're so happy you came and joined us tonight on this Christmas Eve. And we pray you have a blessed Christmas. We love you, church.